So, we're going to start off in Revelation. If you would all turn to the book of Revelation, we're going to start in chapter 21. So I have a quote for you this morning while you're looking it up. I thought it very fitting of as we spend time studying the Bible, you know, and we think towards the whole goal of this whole thing is to see people saved. The whole goal of the, the, the seven steps to God Bible study is to see people get saved. So, here's the quote. The Bible is like a pool, shallow enough that a child can come get a drink of water without fear of drowning, yet so deep that scholars can swim in it and never touch the bottom. This is God's word to us. This is what God has given us, this side of glory, for us to be able to tell things about Him, to see the plan of salvation. And it is so fitting that it it doesn't matter how long you study God's word, you will always find new things. You'll always see things that, you know, something you come across that you may have read the passage a hundred times, and then you'll come across it one day, and God just gives you enough light that day that you're like, wow, I've never seen it that way before. I really hope that this is the lesson where people will start to see that. If it's already happened, that's awesome. But if you're going through somebody or going through the seven steps to God with somebody and they get to that point where they're like, wow, you know, maybe I didn't see it that way or I hadn't seen it that way. They they haven't seen, you know, from lesson one when we talked about the soul and how the soul has to be converted and the importance in that or, or they've spent time, you know, listening to you giving Bible verses and they've realized lesson two and three and the importance of the Bible wow, the Bible really is important. And then we went through, you know, the importance of Jesus Christ and His shed blood. And we talked about spiritual light and truth. And now we're spending time yet again today with the importance of being born again. And hopefully through all that, people have started to get to that point where they can see the importance of being born again. So, Revelations chapter 1, 21, sorry, verse number 24 says, And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you for today. I want to thank you for another day that you've given us to serve you, to love you, Lord, to tell others about you. And I pray, Lord, that we would just bring you glory and honor in everything that we do today. That would be a time that we can spend in your word, worshiping you and growing to a closer walk with you. We pray, Lord, you'd be with the visitors that would be here today, Lord. We pray that we would see a lost soul saved today and eternity would be changed because of it. And we pray it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So who is going to be in heaven? Who will make it into heaven? Well, verse 24 told us, and the nations of them which are saved. The people that are saved, the people who have been born again are those that are going to make up heaven. You know, when we look through different states or countries, you're like, oh, well, what are the people that make up that state or that country. We can look at America. Who are the people that make up America? Well, they're Americans. Well, who are the people that make up heaven? The Christians. Those that are saved. Those that have been born again. They've had a time in their life where they have become a Christian. You know, we'll talk in a little bit about how we've, nobody in the life and nobody in life has been a Christian their whole life. They, everyone has to come to that point in time where they become a Christian. Why do we have to get saved? Well, we have a punishment that is coming. Judgment is coming. Because we have sinned, we must be saved. Romans 14.12 says, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. We went through and talked about the Ten Commandments and how we, you know, how we can break each and every one of those commandments. And then it's just one of those commandments is what's keeping us from going to heaven. If, if we've broken one of them, we've broken all of them. We are guilty of all. Um, So what is truth? We spent time talking about spiritual truth and light. We spent time talking about the importance of God's word. So what is truth? In John 17, 17, Christ said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. We have a copy of his word. We have a copy of truth. In a world that's constantly going through and trying to decide what is morally right, what is morally wrong, they neglect to look back to God's Word and see, well, what is truth? What, how, do, how can we define these other things if we don't even understand what truth is? God's Word is truth. Now, Bible truth is what we need. We, we need this to be able to, to see the things that God has given us. Um, you, we think about the rich man who is in hell. 
What did he ask for when he was in hell? Not, not the drink of water or a drop of water. He asked for somebody to go back and to tell his, his family, tell his brothers. And what did Christ respond to that? Or what is the biblical response to that? It says, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Well, was he actually referring to Moses and the prophets at that point in time? Well, no. He was referring to the Bible. We look at the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. Moses has written, or Moses wrote those books. So that's what he could be referring to. You look at the rest of the Old Testament. It was written by prophets. Well, you have all that you need. Uh, I've heard a lot of people talk about, well, you know, we live in the church age. We live in the day of grace. Um, you know, we, we can look through the New Testament. Is the Old Testament really that important? Well, yes, it is important because God says all Scripture is given for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. We have all these things. All Scripture, it's all profitable for us. But you can lead somebody to Christ through the Old Testament. There's plenty of verses in the Old Testament that can lead somebody to see Bible truth, to see God's truth, His Word, to see their need of being saved. It can, it can be found anywhere throughout the Bible. So what are, what are our steps? How do we get to this point where we can be born again? What do we need to do? Besides God's truth, we will also be judged according to God's standards. Now we went through, we talked about the Ten Commandments. We talked about how we could break each other and every one of them. James 2.10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend at one point, he is guilty of all. Do you know there are other commands that are given? Throughout the scriptures, it's not just the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments encompass a lot of things, but there are many other things that are given. Um, it's, do, you, do you love your neighbor as yourself? I think that's usually a pretty big one. Do we love our neighbor as ourself? Do you put your neighbor's needs before your own needs? Do you make sure that your neighbor has food on the table? Do you make sure your neighbor you know, has clothes, has the things that they need? Well, it says that we're supposed to love our neighbor as ourself. I made sure that I had clean clothes this morning, and I was made sure I was able to have a coffee, cup of coffee this morning. I didn't offer anybody else a cup of coffee this morning, so if you would all like a cup of coffee, you can, after the service is over, you can go have a cup of coffee. Am I loving my neighbor as myself? Are, you know, we can go through more and more. So, uh, are you willing to meet their needs no matter what the cost? No matter what the need is, are we willing to do that? Christ supplied our need. What does Christian mean? We're Christ-like. We're, we're supposed to be like Christ. You know, the Bible tells us they were called Christians first at Antioch. Well, are we being Christ-like? Are we being a, a picture of him? Um, have we ever been selfish or angry or impatient or wasteful or proud or gossipy or stingy? insensitive, insincere, inappropriate, undependable, unforgiving. I mean, we, the list goes on and on. Yes, maybe you think that you can make it through the Ten Commandments, which we proved you cannot. But there is just a list of things, and we're going to be judged for all of our actions. We're going to be judged for what we have done according to God's Word. Um, so we need to realize that we're a sinner. We have to get to that point. Anybody who is sitting in this room today that is a Christian today has come to that point where they have realized, I'm a lost sinner on my way to hell. But God has created this way for me to get to heaven. You know, Christ said he has come to seek and to save what? That which was lost. You know, I, I kind of set that parameter a couple of weeks ago that you, there is actually a requirement for salvation. We've got to see that we're lost. We've got to see our need of a Savior. We have to get to that point, and we must realize that we're sinners. Um, going to heaven is not something that is ever going to be automatic. Again, nobody has been saved their whole life. We've talked to people, many of us have talked to people who have just said, oh, I've always been a Christian. My parents have always gone to church. You know, this is something that we've always done as a family. Um, you know, and it's just, you know, God's day has always been important to us. And I've just, I've always been a Christian. But we need to reconcile the verses in the Bible that says, you know, you must be born again. Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. You know, we got, God has given us the power to become the sons of God. We, we have to become a Christian. It's not something that's automatic. It's not something that is 
ever going to just be, oh, well, yep, we're just going to put that on their account because, you know, we're nice people. You go to a store, you buy some groceries, they have a coupon available. Oh, well, we just automatically put that in there. It's in the computer already. No, we need to have Christ's blood applied to our account. We have to have that point. John 3.18 says, He that believeth not is condemned already. You know, many people have said, Oh, I'll make the decision someday. Someday I'll get there, and I'm, someday I'll decide if I'm going to be a Christian or not. In saying someday, you're making a decision already. The Bible has told us, you are condemned already. So it's not a choice of, you know, well, do I choose that, you know, I'm going to be a Christian now, or do I choose that I'm going to be a Christian later? You, you are either going to make the choice in life to be a Christian or to stay where you're at. It's not a decision of now, oh, well, I'm choosing to be a bad person. I'm choosing to break all these laws or break all these commandments. The choice has already been made. You didn't have any control over it. We were born in sin. So people are nev- never automatically going to go to heaven. Uh, John 3.36 says, He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. These are automatic things. You want to look at something that's automatic, salvation not being one of them? The wrath of God is automatic. Adam sinned. We were born in man's image. We were born in sin. So nobody is ever automatically going to go to heaven. Romans 1.18 says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. There's a lot of people in the world that take sin lightly. They don't think it's a big deal. You know, when, when you take one of the, I don't know if we can for sure qualify it as this, but take one of the simplest commandments and just say, thou shalt not lie. How many of us have heard, well, it's just a white lie. It's just a little lie. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. You know, just a little bit of lack of truth. There are many times Satan has deceived numbers of people and given mostly truth. And then he just, that, just that little bit of falsehood in there, it just redirects everything. It gives, totally changes everything. So what do we need to be saved from? Our sin. We need to be saved from this sin. Um, God said in Psalms 19.7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. So we can go right back into looking at the importance of the Bible that we already discussed. God's word is the thing that is going to show us our need of salvation and show us how to be saved from our sins so that we don't have to endure this eternal punishment which is coming for each and every one of us. That is the automatic portion. You know, self-righteousness sends a lot of people to hell. Maybe that's not a word that gets used a whole lot anymore. I'm finding there's a lot of words that really aren't used anymore. But what about self-righteousness? Well, I'm, I'm good. I'm okay. Well, we talked about the story about the Pharisee and the publican and how the Pharisee was better than the publican and the publican was, you know, actually confessing his sins and talking to God and, and Christ said that one of them left justified. Well, it wasn't the Pharisee. The Pharisee thought he was better than everybody else. You know, one of those, okay, I'm, you know, looking sharp and professional. And I think I've talked before, very briefly, some of the conversations that I've had with witnessing to people, we will spend time going through, like, trailer parks. And people will invite you into, the, into their house and be like, oh, yeah, come in, come on, sit down, have a seat, let's talk. And then we would go through areas in, in Fargo, for example, that were multi-million dollar homes and nobody has time for you. Nobody cares. They're self-righteous. They're dignified. They're, I don't have any time for that. I'm good the way that I am. Self-righteousness sends a lot of people to hell. <clears throat> Luke 19.10 is the verse that says, The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Again, we need to see that. That is the key to salvation. So what do we need for salvation? What do we need to do? Well, one of the things we need to do is repentance. The Bible tells us that. Um, Repentance, for example, is the twin sister of faith. We're told that we need repentance and we need faith so that we can be saved. Turn over to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, and we're going to take a look at verse 21. 
Here in God's word it says, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. We have to have both. Um, you know, we can, we can get very, very deep into some things, but repentance it is literally just turning away from the things that we're following, the things of the world. Uh, you know, it, people have often said it's a 180 degree change. You're literally walking towards hell. You're walking towards the world. You're walking in the way that Satan is trying to guide you and direct you or our flesh is taking us and it is a 180, 180 degree turn and we are now walking towards Christ. You know, I, I have often, the teens have heard me often pray, Lord, help me to walk closer with you today than I did yesterday because I want to constantly be heading in that direction. I want to be heading towards Christ and we have to get to that point where we see, you know what, this, this isn't going to work. I can't do this on my own. I have to do this through Christ. I have to do it through His means. And so we need repentance. Hebrews 6.1 tells us, repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. You know, we talked about last week people trying to work their way to heaven. We're, we're never going to work our way to heaven. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. You know, it doesn't matter anything that you do and you say, well, I, you know, I did this righteously. I did this for God in His name. Well, in the end, many will cry, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name done many wonderful works? And he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. We have to get to this point of repentance. After we see that our, we have a need, we see that we're lost, we can now get to the point where, okay, I need to repent of this because I want this gift that Christ has. I want this gift of salvation. Do you know repentance is something that's it's not complicated. It's very, very simple. But many people try to change it, and they try to complicate it. They want to make it easier for them, and maybe I can find a wide road, like we talked about last week. I want to make this easier. Salvation is simple. Salvation is easy. It's not something that we need to overcomplicate. We need to repent to God. We need to have faith in Him that He has done the right thing, or, sorry, he obviously did the right thing. Because he has died on the cross for our sins. You know, we're at the point where God has already done all of this for me. God has already created this way. But too many people in the world, they want to have their cake and eat it too. They want to, well, I want to have this mush God. You know, we talked about uh, men's darling sin and how they create a God of their own imagination. We want to have this mush God, but we still want to have salvation. You know, I still want to be saved. I still want to even be able to go to heaven. But I want to live like the world. I want to live any way that I can possibly live so that I can you know, do all these other things and not have to worry about God's truth and God's word. So what does repentance mean we're going to turn away from? Sometimes we're going to turn away from what people think. Revelations 21.8 told us, The fearful and unbelieving shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire. You know, there's a lot of people in the world that are saying, oh, he just got religion. He just, you know, he's, he's on that Jesus thing right now. Well, there needs to be a difference in our life. If those are the type of friends that we're hanging out with, if those are the type of people we're with, I'm sorry, you're not, you know, I, I feel like I use the verse a lot with the teens, iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Well, I want to find other Christians who are going to help me walk closer with God well, maybe repentance means I'm going to turn away from these people. I'm going to turn away from some of the people that are trying to lead me astray, lead me down the wrong path. You know, I want to walk towards God, not back towards the world. Uh, what about self-importance and pride? Well, you know, we can think about Simon the sorcerer and, and the things that he wanted to do. He wanted to be important. He wanted to have, you know, these abilities to be able to cast out demons and do all these things. You know, he was a, thought he was a pretty important guy. Paul had to repent of his works salvation and his false religion in order to be saved. You know, I wonder often what the things that Paul thought of while he was sitting there, not able to see anything, and all of the thoughts that just rolled through his mind as he was going over things. He knew the scriptures. He knew the Bible. And I wonder if God just gave him that time to sit there and think over things. Just get to the point where, all right, God, I, I see the error of my ways. 
I, I see how I've done these things wrong. I've tried to work my way to heaven. I've tried to use these, you know, uh, man-made traditions that we've put in. Because he, you know, he was in the, uh, he was one of the Pharisees, Sanhedrin. You know, he was in these big groups, and he saw that. Well, we're going to do this. Well, I hope during that period of time that he had lots of time, or he had lots of time to reflect and see. Wow, this was. You know, maybe this wasn't the right thing to be doing. Maybe this wasn't the direction that I was supposed to be going. Um, uh, people, I mentioned last week, alcohol. We have people, a world that is just drowning in alcohol and having a great time, and they think it's totally okay. Maybe that's something that we're going to have to turn away from, that we're going to have to repent of. 1 Corinthians 6.10 says, Drunkards shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, I think, as we've established, God's word is truth. Well, he says it's not going to happen, but the world thinks it's totally okay. The world thinks, oh, it's okay for me to go out and socially drink Saturday night and then still go to church on Sunday morning. Well, God said wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. God has given us scripture to tell us away from that. What about false religion? There's a lot of that going on today. There's a lot of people who are deceived by some of these false religions and think that they're heading in the right direction and think they got the right thing going on, but they're just being deceived. They're being drawn away. If you look back through history, and here's a shameless plug for our classes that we're going to be start, starting this fall for the Bible Institute, one of them is Christian history. And we go through and we look at a lot of, we're going to be looking at a lot of different things, and you can see how some of these other religions, well, Maybe they started here. They started in the right direction. But even as the Bible tells us, they went out from us because they were not of us. And then they created this new religion. And they're like, oh, we're going to do things this way. You know, I often think of the uh, term that the Catholics use, that they use transubstantiation. And so they, you know, they take the wine and they believe it's actually the blood of Christ. Uh, they, you know, eat the wafer. They think it's actually the body of Christ. Well, then the Lutheran church decided, oh, no, 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 we're not going to believe in that because that's messed up. That's wrong. We're going to believe in consubstantiation, which means we're going to eat it and it's bread, you know, and we're going to drink it and it's, it's wine. But then somehow magically inside it, it turns into the body and blood of Christ. Well, you can track all these religions down and, and see, you know, that they've kind of just like gone a little further astray and a little further astray and they've rerouted things. And now we have all these false religions that are pointing people in the wrong direction. They're taking people away. And you know what a lot of it really comes down to? A lot of it really comes down to the fact that, well, I don't think God is actually that way. I don't think, you know, what God says in his word, I don't think that's actually how God says. Because what happens if that is? Well, now I'm accountable. Now I'm accountable to everything that is in that book. I'm accountable to what God has told me to do and not to do. I have to do all these things now. Well, I don't want to be accountable for that. I don't want to have to worry about that. That, that just sounds terrible. Well, now we have how many umpteen false religions that are leading people in the wrong direction. What about family? Are we going to have to repent of family? There are people in the world that are of a particular religion that if they leave that religion, if they get saved, they find Christ, they get, or get saved, become born again, their family, they're just, they're dead to their family. They'll have to go on and do, you know, I mean, it is literally like the day that they find out that that person is what they would call quote-unquote saved, they're dead to me. Nope, you're not my son anymore. You're not my daughter anymore. People have had to turn their backs on families because the family has said, oh, no, that's ridiculous. You don't need that. Or, or I can't believe that you would fall for all that false information and everything, and somebody's just brainwashing you. There are people that have had to turn their backs on family because you ought to obey God rather than man. And they said, you know what? I'm going to walk with God. I'm going to do the right thing, whether it's easy or not. I'm going to do the right thing. What about greed and materialism? Christ talked to the rich young ruler and said that, go, sell all that thou hast, and then come and follow me. Well, it says that he went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. Oh, man, I'm going to have to sell all this stuff? I'm going to have to get rid of all this stuff? Did you keep track of what happened through the New Testament when the church was very starting to do things after Christ had left and a lot of people were selling their land and giving it to the church? Well, I don't need this anymore. 
I'm going to sell it to the, you know, church. I'm going to, or not sell it to the church, sell it to give the money to the church. Because I don't need, or I've got God, you know. I don't need all these things. I want to follow God. I don't want anything else to be more important to me than God. Today, people are consumed with material things. They're consumed with having, oh, I've got to get that next cool thing. I've got to get that next awesome thing that's coming out. And, well, then we can get back into the Ten Commandments and say, oh, man, my friend has this. I'd really like to have that. Well, now we're back into covetousness. The world is consumed with yet another thing of greed and materialism. They just, they just want more. Think about some of the companies that are out there. You know, they've been talking a lot lately about everything that's going on over in China and, and how all the manufacturing, a lot of it has been moved to different countries out of the United States. Why? Because people are greedy. Because, well... I'm going to have to pay these people this much to do the work, but I could send it over there and pay them way less to do the same work, and then I'm going to technically get the same product, and it's going to let me make more money. I don't know if anybody has ever heard the story. Um, Dr. David Gibbs, Christian Law Association, tells a story about his grandpa who had gotten done with school. I, I think he said like sixth or seventh grade. He was just like, I, just, I can't do this anymore. I'm just not fit for school. And so he went out, and he did some work, and he bought a cow. And he cut up that cow and sold all the meat and made money off of it. You know, I'm not a super smart guy, but I know how to cut up a cow and you know, get all the meat out of it. Well, he took the money, and then he went and bought another cow. And he did the same thing, and then day after day, until the point where they were just had a meat packing house. I mean, they were, they were taking care of all of these needs for everything. And I thought it was really funny, the story that he tells, that it got to the point where they were buying cattle all over the place. And David Gibbs tells the story that many, many times he had gone over to farmers' houses, traveled late into the night to go to somebody's house, taking this little envelope that his grandpa had given him that said, I want you to go and take this envelope and give it to that farmer because we're Christians and we're not going to buy those cows that cheap. That's just not fair to that person. Well, Grandpa, we had the lowest bid at the auction. Well, yeah, but would you want somebody to buy your cows that cheap? And so he said he would go to all these people's houses and late into the night dropping off these envelopes of money to people. My grandpa said, we're a Christian, and we don't do this. You know why? Because the man wasn't greedy. Guess what? The man wasn't a scholar either. David Gibbs has said that many times. My grandpa wasn't the world's smartest man. He said simply, I knew how to cut up a cow, and I started from there because it's all I really knew how to do. But now we have people in the world that are just brilliant people by the world's gauge that are consumed with, oh, I've got to have the next cool thing. I've got to have the next nice thing. So they're consumed with greed and materialism. Um, there's people that have, are dealing with wrong living. Um, you know, think about the guy, the, the rough life that the Philippian jailer probably had. You know, he's taking care of all these people. He's... I can't imagine he's probably super nice to these people. I mean, he's probably dealing with some pretty scummy people and just like, nope, you guys are all crummy people and criminals and whatever, and I don't know. Probably some conjecture on my part. But he's the one that said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? He saw the difference. He needed to turn from his wrong living. you know. And then we, we can see everything that took place in his life. Not everything. We can see that he got saved. His whole family got saved. You know, and, and we can see the change. Sometimes a repentance just means turning away from all of these things that we're consumed with. All of these things that we're doing in life. Do you know there's people that are not going to repent? There's people who are not going to choose God? Oh, I'm not going to make a decision right now. Well, again, you've already made your decision. Let's turn over to Acts chapter 26. We should be pretty close here. Acts chapter 26. Many of you will hopefully recognize this story. Acts chapter 26, verse 28. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. There's a lot of people in the world that are that way. Oh, man. Almost. You almost did it. You almost persuaded me to be a Christian. Man, I really thought I was, you know, I was believing what you were saying and I was right there with you and 
I don't know. I'm just not ready for it. I'm just not ready to, you know, do that yet. You know, I'll wait till I'm on my deathbed and do it or, you know, fill in the blank of any number of things. You know, there are people who are going to choose not to go to heaven. Uh, Acts 24, hopefully. Acts 24, verse 25 says, and, he, and as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment, so come, to come, sorry, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time, which I, when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Again, it's an Agrippa situation. Ah, uh, come back another day. I usually am very thankful when somebody says, well, you can come back at this time. Well, good, I'm glad that, you know, Lord willing, I'm going to have another opportunity to talk to you. But they don't know that God's not going to take them home that day. They don't know that God's not going to take them home as I'm walking off the doorstep. You never know that. And people are consciously choosing, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to make that decision. I'm not going to choose that path. True conversion to Christ requires a willingness to stand for Him. Salvation is simple, but it's not shallow. When we choose to be a Christian, we're choosing, I'm going to stand with God. I'm going to stand up for God. We talked about people last week taking the Lord's name in vain. Are you standing up for God? Think about the book of Ephesians. When it goes through and it talks about the armor of the Lord. Having done all, stand. We live in a day and age where we need to stand. There's so many Christians in the world that, or so-called Christians, that are letting people run all over them. They're not standing for God's word. They're not standing in defense of Christ. And Christ flat out tells us in his word, well, they're doing this because they hate me. It's not because they hate you. It's because they hate me. And we still just let it go. We still just let it slide. True conversion will result in this willingness. You know what? I'm going to stand up for God. I'm going to stand with God. I, I want to be a Christian. I want to do the right thing. There's been many people, no doubt, that have come through this auditorium that have said, yeah, I got saved. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, you look at them today and you really couldn't tell. And I know it's between them and God. But God's Word also tells us that we'll see fruit in their life. You'll see a change in their life. True repentance, true Christianity, we'll see people change. You'll see people take a stand for God. Luke 9.62 says, No man having his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. We can't get saved and just say, uh, yeah, well, I'm just going to keep this little sin over here by the side. I know it's wrong, I know it's wrong, but I'll, I'll get it right eventually. We're not supposed to do that. It says, no man having his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. When we choose that we're going to follow God, when we choose that we're going to walk with him, it needs to be an all or nothing. Jesus is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. We need to make that decision. We need to be 100%. I'm going to follow God. Turn over to Luke chapter 14. Every person must carefully consider how much they really want to be saved. Do you really want to have salvation? Do you really want to be saved? Luke chapter 14, and we're going to start in verse number 28. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? And verse 33, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. There's a lot of people that ask that question when they're looking at salvation. Well, what, what will other people think? Well, what will this change for my job? What will this change for my life? What will this change for my attitude? You know, th this could change everything. You're right. It will change everything. It, when you have a 
or when you have the time where you become born again, it'll change every aspect of your life. And it is a wonderful thing. It is an awesome thing. Think about the little kid song that's, you know, the things I used to do, I don't do them anymore, or the places I used to go, I don't go there anymore. There's a huge change that takes place in our life. And there are people that need to consider that. This is going to change your life forever. Am I trying to talk you out of it? Never. Never trying to talk you out of it. But I want you to think about this. This is going to change your life. It is going to be the most wonderful thing that you will ever have this side of eternity. But think about it. Make sure, you know what? You're right. I do want to do this. I do want to get saved. There's so many people that have fought false professions in this world because somebody else pushed them to do it. Or, oh, my friends are getting saved. I need to get saved. Or, oh, yeah, the preacher preached a really good message and he talked about salvation. And, well, you know, I want to be with my friends in heaven. Fill in the blank. There's so many other things that can be said. But when you're genuinely at that point where you're like, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. I've come to the point where I've realized I am lost. I am on my way to hell. I want to do this. I want to do the right thing. I want to follow Christ. I know that he died on the cross for my sins. I want to head in the right direction. We're considering everything that has taken place. We're considering the cost. While salvation is free, it's not cheap. God has offered this free gift to all of us, but Christ paid the ultimate sacrifice for us to have this free gift. So what is faith? Well, you could say, well, Brother Justin, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Well, yeah, but what does it mean? Well, it's not a feeling. I can tell you that. We live in a world that's hooked on a feeling they're just like, oh, well, I, oh, man, I just, it feels good or it feels right. I don't see that description when it talks about faith. I don't see that description when it talks about a lot of things throughout God's Word. Titus 1-2 says, In hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. Okay, so God made this promise, and God cannot lie. So faith is simply taking God at his word. I've talked about the Bible promise book before that anybody I get the opportunity to lead to Christ, I try to always give them a copy uh, of God's promises. There's like a thousand promises in this one book. And it gives you, you know, all these categories. You can look through it and, okay, well, maybe I'm struggling with this today. Well, when you're looking through that and you're finding encouragement in that, what are you really doing? Well, I'm having faith that God said this and that he meant it. Well, if we find faith in that, shouldn't we find faith in the fact that, you know, God sent his only son to die on the cross for our sins so that we can have eternal life? It's just trusting God at his word. It's taking God's word and believing God said this and he meant it. And it's true because God cannot lie. It literally tells us that in Titus 1-2. Jesus promises, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. We, if we're seeking God, if we're looking for God, God promises, I will never cast that person out. I will never just discredit that person or get rid of that person. God wants us to come to him. He wants us to just take him as it is word. Romans 10, 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So all of these things that we've gone through and looked at, all of the, the truth that we've seen, the light of God's word, the importance of Christ and his shed blood, the importance of God's word, the importance of our soul being converted. It all comes down to, I need to take God at his word. If he said that he sent his son to die on the cross for my sins, and I've seen through his word that I'm a sinner, that I could never keep all of these commandments, I've broken his law, there's only one way for me to get to heaven. God's word says that. So I guess I'm going to have to just take God at his word. You promised that you would save me. You promised that your son paid the penalty for my sin. Okay, I believe you. I've done all these things that have just, you know, I've never lived my life for Christ. I've never, you know, there are people who have been in churches their whole lives. There's people who have never been in a church but they can all realize the point that, yeah, 
I've done these wrong things. I've broken this law. And I want this free gift. You know, there's nothing to say that it's the words. Here, I have this very specific phrase that you have to say. And if you magically say this, you will auto-magically be saved. It's not how it works. You listen to people's salvation testimonies, and it's, I always enjoy listening to it, and you hear how they're all different. They all still have the cent- one central theme, but they're all different. It's not in the words that you say. It's not in, you know, this, well, I was standing on one foot, and I had my hands folded, and, you know, I said this exact phrase, and I got saved. That's not what it's about. A lot of lives can be affected if we go out and start telling people about Christ. A lot of lives can be changed by God's, God's word. This could be a great tool for us to use. Any devotional, your testimony, God's word, can be a great tool to seek and to save that which was lost. So I hope this whole time that we've been able to spend looking at all these different steps that we've called the seven steps to God, I hope you can use it to somebody. I hope if there's somebody sitting in the room today that has listened to all this and see their need of a Savior, don't wait. Don't wait one more day. But we need to be out there telling others. And like we started off this whole thing with, I want to give you guys a tool that you can use to tell others and point others towards Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you so much that we've had the opportunity to look at your word Lord, I pray that we would just bring you glory and honor today. I pray that you'd be with us as we worship with you this morning, be with Brother Mike as he preaches this morning. Lord, I, I pray that you would, I pray that we would see visitors today. Lord, that we would see somebody get saved today. Lord, we would see all of heaven rejoicing for one lost soul that's saved. And I pray that we would, we would see it that way. I pray that we would go out and tell others about you, that we would be witnessing, that we would be sharing our testimony Lord, we thank you so much for the love that you had for us to send your son and die on that cross so that we didn't have, don't have to go to hell. Lord, we thank you for everything you do. We pray it all in your son's precious name. Amen.